thank you so much for joining me. I am Kat Vine, and this is Cat Calls, the show that I do every Thursday on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Cat Vine. I am Cat Vine. I am a music journalist. I write for Spin sometimes, which is why I come and bring this show over here to Spin's channel once a month. Um, it's a super fun show. It's an interactive show. It's a show that you, the viewer, are a part of. Um, if you have questions for our guests, please do drop it. And if you like the show today, I encourage you to go on YouTube and check out some of the old episodes. I publish all my old Cat Calls episodes, whether they happen on Spin or my channel, over on YouTube. So you can go ahead and search for me there. All right, so getting into it, uh, today I am so very happy to welcome one of my all-time favorite artists is here. Everybody give it up for Wave Racer! <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, Wave Racer is hailing from Australia, and he is was a pioneer of the feature-based movement of the early 2010s. One of the best shows I ever went to in my life was the Future Classic Showcase at WMC 2012, where Rave Racer played Bardo alongside Cashmere Cat and What's So Not and Flume and Touch Sensitive. It was truly an incredible night. But even among a lineup like that, Wave Racer stands out for his shiny rainbow sounds. Um, they pop like soda bubbles in your face. And to listen to his music is to mainline joy, honestly. Like it's the soundtrack to all of my colorful video game fantasies. <laughs> I was honored to interview him last year for Billboard Dance. And and I know he's going to make a super fun guest here on Cat Calls. He's in the chat, so say hello. <laughs> but before we get him on the line officially, we're going to dive into his latest single. It's called Higher, and I listened to it about 70 times yesterday, getting pumped up for today. It really sets the tone for the new music that Wavy has scheduled to come, I think, next year. We'll definitely get all the details on that. If you've been having a hard day, or a week, or a month, or a year, or a lifetime, Hire is the ultimate pick-me-up. I hope you have a dance party wherever you are. You know that we like to have a dance party here at Cat Calls. And when we come back, I'll have Wave Racer on the line. So get your questions ready. Let me see your phones in the chat if you're a Cat Call subscriber. <laughs> I know that uh, Jerk and Jamie are, I'm pretty sure. Zach, Zach, nice to see you. So yes, without further ado, let's watch Higher, and when we come back, we'll have race Rave Racer. I don't know what's going on with my mouth today. It's like the words, they just don't want to come out. Why? I don't know why. They just don't. <laughs> okay, let's just save me from all this embarrassment and watch the video. Okay. Can you take me higher? Take me up and hold me tighter. Give me my desire. Keep me close and keep me flying Baby, don't stop climbing To the top, we keep on rising Can you take me? Can you take me? There it is. <laughs> Woo! There it is! You guys heard it? Okay, you already heard his voice, so let's just bring him onto the show. <laughs> hey! Wave racer! <laughs> Thank up, you. Everyone? Thank you so much for joining me today. It's really quite an honor to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Appreciate it. So... Easy place to start with. Uh, we were just watching the hire video. Jerk at work is saying he fucks with it heavy. I fuck with it heavy. Um, Thank you. Tell me about this song a little bit. Like, I love how positive and bouncy it is. It really is, I think, hitting a good blend between the maximalist club stuff that everyone kind of fell in love with. Well, I fell in love with your music through, but also this more vocal driven pop sound that you're kind of moving towards these days. Hmm. Um, yes. And it has, I'll just let you take it away. You take it away. Okay, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think it's a, it's a definitely a pop track. Uh, it's funny because it's, uh, I made this song actually a few years ago. It's not actually really? like, it's it's a little bit outdated. And if you've watched any of my Twitch stream, I've sort of covered that when I covered the production of that song. It's very, I think I made it in 2017 after I went to London. I did a trip to London. I spent a couple of weeks over there and I met up with like, some other musicians and songwriters and producers, one of which was Danielle Hall from yes. PC Music Camp. Love I met PC up with Music. Him. Yeah, <laughs> huge fan. I, I met up with him and uh, we had a session just, and we basically just kind of experimented with a few different like musical concepts. Um, he's a very conceptual thinker. Like he likes to think conceptually and he had this concept of like an ascension, a higher moving uh, sort of chord progression melody kind of thing. And okay. he kind of, put that idea into music and then I kind of took that with me and then I met up with another uh, singer songwriter the next day called Elle Divine who's a 
a really talented singer um, from London and she has her own project, but she's actually the vocalist on the song. So over the space of this two day period in London, I kind of uh, met up with these two people and created this idea, which was an amalgamation of different musical influences and concepts. And when I got home from London, I I took the track with me and I, I finished producing it over the next sort of like, I don't know, six months or so. It took a while. It kind of went through a, a transformation. At I'm home sure, then, as is often it, the case. <laughs> absolutely, and then yeah, that's what it. That's and that's how it ended up. And I'm pretty happy with it. It's definitely like a. It's definitely one of the more upbeat, sort of uh, deliberately, uh, deliberately bright and joyful and and like reminiscent of ascension uh, the song that I've ever done. It's and it's actually a little bit different to the direction I'm currently headed in. But it's really? it's a good. I think it's a good sort of chapter break between what I did and what I'm about to do. So yeah. Yeah, I, I'm happy. I'm happy with it. I want to get very much into everything you just said there, where you're going, a little bit into where you've been. Um, but I think that this song was really great to drop at a time like this, right? Like and we, we we're all dealing with our own shit and it piles on and it piles on. And higher is a really nice slice of like joyfulness and encouragement and I know that you have made comments about how that song it's interesting that it was kind of named after the chord work that you guys did Mm. but you have talked about how it also for you represents like pushing yourself to a higher place creatively am am I getting that Mm. right or definitely it's uh I spoke I've spoken about how yeah um it was kind of like it was kind of a uh an overcoming of, of sort of some creative hurdles. Um, there were, at the time that I was uh, like going to London and doing that, part of the reason I even went there in the first place was because I was feeling very like creatively stunted, a little bit sort of stuck uh, in, a, in a bit of a weird blockage. There was a lot to do with anxiety and a lot to do with just not like, you know, identity and all that kind of stuff. And so higher kind of represented this, like I'm able to overcome this. I'm able to do better. Um, and, you know, hoping that other people can take that away from it as well. Um, so, yeah, to answer, I think that answers, answers what you're asking. Um, I can't remember. Did you ask me something else in that question as well? <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. I think, I, yeah, I, I just, I'm just happy that you are injecting the world with happiness and joy and bright colors. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you said it was, a, it was a good time to put out yeah, a song like that. And I think, yeah, yeah. you're probably right. It's... um. That wasn't planned, though. When I made the song, I had no idea it would come oh, out during yeah. a, a global pandemic that everyone needed a, a bit of positivity in their lives. Of but, course. You know, I think every time I create a song, I'm trying to inject some sort of, um, some sort of not, I, I, I mean, a lesson is the wrong word, but something that I've always tried to put something that I've learned from my own experiences in the music. And yeah. the idea with, with Hire is, I guess, to, you know, if I can overcome something, then so can you and, and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So I guess it is kind of poignant in that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Um, before, okay, so before we get into my whole line of questions, um, I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit and show you uh, this really cool thing and also just show the world. I made you sign my Wave Race video game uh, once yes. upon a time. <laughs> I remember doing that. I actually do remember that. Yeah. I, I've, I, I've, I'm sure it comes as no surprise that I've actually signed quite a few of them in my time. Oh my god, um, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm so sure. Yeah. Well, I'm very so, proud to have one. <laughs> do you know, what, where was that that that, that happened? That What's, was at what, what Ultra city? Music Festival in Miami okay. some years yep. ago. Uh, I remember that, Ultra, yeah. Was that the same year that you guys did that Future Classic Showcase in Miami? Yeah, probably, yes. Really yeah. the best party. Uh, for me. Yeah. I don't know about for you guys. Yeah, yeah. I played right after uh, Cash Me a Cat, and mm. uh, I think that's the same one, if that's the one they were thinking of. I'm, I, I it remember is. it being very fun. Yeah, yeah, it was so much fun. Wait, so how many wave races have you have you signed over the years? <laughs> at least at least five, maybe more. I don't it's know. So I've, also, I've signed a bunch of different various video game paraphernalia and other Nintendo cartridges as well, but that one's definitely made an appearance at a number of gigs. I mean, it has to. <laughs> it's a classic. Yeah. But I think I heard once, maybe, I don't know if you told me or if someone else told me, have you not actually played the Wave Race game? It wasn't like you had this growing up, right? No, no. I've never played Wave Race. I definitely played Nintendo 64. That was like my first games console as a kid. So there's a huge amount of nostalgia and uh, positive emotion associated with the idea of that game. Yeah. And like that other other similar games in that vein. Like I played countless hours of, of Nintendo 64. Oh my but God, I never actually, me and my brother kind of like shared a Nintendo 64 growing up as kids. And we never actually owned that game. 
What uh, were the games so yeah. that you uh, that you played the most? What are the ones that you remember the most fondly? For me, it was like Mario 64, Star Fox 64. Yep. What, what uh, was going for on? Me, for me, I think it was probably a combination of Mario Kart 64. Yes, Mario um, Kart, yes. Yeah, the original Super Smash Bros. 64 and uh, GoldenEye. The 007 yeah. GoldenEye, where we just like shoot each other and kill each other all the time. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that was like yeah. everyone's favorite. Was that maybe the first first person shooter? Was it a first person it was, shooter? It was a first person shooter, yeah. It wasn't the first, but it was definitely an early one, and it was like a groundbreaking, like the way that they, it was, yeah, produced by Rare, and like they, they went on to be, have a huge legacy associated with their games, yeah. and yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> your sound definitely does take, I think, in the beginning of your career, a lot of influence from those old Nintendo 64 soundtracks. I mean, do you remember being quite influenced by that music at the time? Did it make a big uh, impression on you? I think it probably wasn't an explicit thing that I was aware of, but it was definitely something that definitely happened. Like, I, I sat in front of the, that game, like, the game's console so many hours that I would have been soaking in all this, like, it, like something about the way that the games are designed, and that includes the music that's in them, it feels like they're speaking directly to you. Like, with, with film and TV and stuff, like, when you sit down and you watch a show or a movie, it's like that, that tells you what's happening and what you're supposed to feel in that moment. But with yeah. a game, you have to discover all of that for yourself, more or less. Like, it's, it still has direction and stuff, but a lot of it is, is that journey of discovery is your own. Yeah. And so um, I think what I... It was more about that feeling than the actual music itself, but, of course, the music is always associated with that feeling. And, um, you know, that's the, the, that music that I was hearing was the soundtrack to those discoveries and that me finding my own like becoming aware of the fact that I can make my own decisions and do crazy stuff and like all that kind of thing so I think that yeah it's it's less about just it's less about me like being obsessed with that music and more about that music being associated with that feeling yeah I totally feel that that makes a lot of yeah. sense and I like that interpretation of it um I myself I've, I'm constantly getting like old Mario or Pokemon music stuck in my head it's like I've just listened to it so many times I love your Mr. Cool mug <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty cool, right? I'm a cool guy, so cool. wait, why do I know what Mr. Cool is? Where does Mr. Cool come from? It's like an old, uh, it's like an old book, children's book. Yeah, thing. yeah, like, yeah, uh, like the seventies or cool. something. Yeah, well, they're still around today. There's Mr. Cool. There's Mr. Loads of stuff. There's like Mr. and Mrs. Everything. Like, I just happen to have the Mr. Cool one. I, it's because <laughs> you're Mr. Cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, um. <laughs> Were you also into, like, what other music were you listening to around that time? Were you into the electropop Euro trash stuff, like Aqua? Like, I feel like the PC music in particular taps into a lot of that vibe. And Yeah, I, well, as a, as a child, like, during that time where I was, like, discovering, like, what I was just talking about, I wasn't actually a huge music listener at that time, apart from the fact that I was exposed to, like, music games and tv and all that stuff i really only started listening to music properly like when i reached high school which was kind of mm. after that fact um and then i think what you mentioned pc music i think a lot of well with a lot of some of the aspects of that music production is is, a, is an element of nostalgia and it is going back into a to a you know that early early 2000s turn of the century kind of like pop sound um which again i feel like it's associated with a feeling and when yeah. you're talking about like it's uh, it, it's it's nostal It's looking back to to rem to reminisce about those feelings of what it's like to be young at that time or whatever. But like my, the first music I really listened to was probably like rock music. Like yes. I, I was I was in like high school. I play. I was a guitarist, like learning how to play guitar and like heavy rock and like you know Rage Against the Machine and like <laughs> like Red Hot Chili Peppers and like you know all that kind of good stuff. You know, classic teenage boy vibe. I, uh, I love it, too. I was right there with you. Yeah. I, I had a guitar. Yeah. I learned how to play, like, one Incubus song, <laughs> yeah. a yeah, few yeah, chords. Yeah. I thought I was going to be the next Sex Pistols for a little bit yeah. there. <laughs> That's it. That was, that was my whole high school experience until I turned, like, 16, 17 when I, a friend of mine, well, 
Bas- you know, might know him as Basenji. He's the other producer in Pablo J and the Love Story. Ah, oh, yes, yes. He, he was, he, we went to high school together, and he was actually the one who introduced me to electronic music, like saying, oh, there's other ways to make music that doesn't include guitars. And I was like, and oh, okay, like, wow, what's what? that? Crazy. I was 16 at the time. I was like, what do you mean? And then he showed me, like, Justice and Daft Punk and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Literally my favorite time to be alive was 2007 yeah. with Justice yeah. and Daft Punk yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And I think that for me, it resonated particularly because they were bringing in elements of the rock music that I liked so much. Like, it didn't sound just like the trance that I had heard or even the drum and bass I heard a lot of in Miami. Like, I was lucky in Miami to be surrounded by a lot of club music, but that music felt different when I first heard it. Yeah. It wasn't, I think uh, dance music and electronic music at that time had a reputation for just being kick drum, doof doof, no notes, like just warehouse party, like gritty, dirty, like drug taking music. But <laughs> then, then it was like, oh, okay, there's actually ways that you can incorporate amazing, innovative, crazy sound design, the kind of stuff that, what, what the kind of stuff that made punk rock exciting was yeah. the same stuff that was making electronic music exciting. It was like distortion and like things that you like just the, I don't give a shit attitude and like I'll do whatever I want do crazy processing compress everything and like that there was an attitude to it that was uh yeah like it's it's kind of like I always say that this is kind of a tangent but I think that modern like uh rap music that's really popular at the moment is kind of like punk music yeah it's kind of like how the newest rap is like punk and I think at that time electronic music was kind of like punk in a way I'm 100% with you there. I I feel the same way. I felt the way at the time. Because punk is really that attitude, like you said, of like, I don't really care what the rules are. I'm going to do what I think is cool. And then you get this, like, beautiful movement of young people who are also like, I also think that's cool. And then you just go balls to the wall. Uh, Yeah, and it it kind of, it it took a new turn for, like, what, uh, what it meant to be a, a, a person making electronic music, but just music in general. Like yeah. that. Nowadays, we see that kind of stuff is just in all music. It's just it's just popular music now. Yeah. It's not even there's no distinction between that and like pop music. It's, it's just that's it's just true. what music is now. And I feel like some of the most exciting and like punk rock stuff is happening in this weird alt pop world that's exploding right now. Like absolutely acts like 100 gex. Like it's you listen to it and you're like, this is weird, but I love it. Yeah. Like, it's the same same vibe. It's yeah. like yeah, it's like it all comes like the word. It's funny how I said the word punk, but I don't mean punk as like the genre punk. It's like right. punk is like an idea. It's exactly. like the ideology of like oh, this is an attitude. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like exactly like you said, 100 gex, all that like hyper crazy pop music stuff that's happening. Um, it's wild and it's it's such a it's such a beautiful and exciting movement to see yeah, and, um, yeah stuff that absolutely. actually gets you excited to listen to music I think <laughs> absolutely it's, it's what it's what like it's so ne- it's 100 percent necessary for that to exist because if it didn't then there would be no there would be no sense of innovation or progression or drive towards um, you know cultural and artistic uh, revelation you know mm-hmm. it's it's really important yeah. I agree. Yeah. So going back to those days with, what was your friend's name from Pablo J and the Lobsterettes? Uh, well, Basenji is his artist name. Basenji. His real, his real name is just Sebastian. Okay, Sebastian. <laughs> your great yeah. friend Sebastian who broadened yeah. your horizons. What was it like yeah. when you first started experimenting with, were you always, or you're an Ableton guy, right? Like, were you always yeah. an Ableton guy? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, how it started is shortly after Sebastian introduced me to that stuff, um, he showed me this thing called a launch pad. <laughs> which oh, is yeah. A, a, a square device that has an 8x8 eight 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 grid of buttons on it, 64 buttons. Made famous by Maddion's pop culture, right? Is that the same that's right. piece of equipment? Same thing. Yeah, exactly the same <laughs> thing. So I, I got one actually before pop culture came out. I already had one of those and I was experimenting with it was like it was kind of just using it as a sampler i was like oh cool i can press a button and a sound happens like that's awesome so i got that and it came with a demo disc of ableton with like in the product because it um no like the, it was like some brand partnership where like they would sell the product and you'd get the software to use the product with so um that's what i i, I got one of those for christmas like for my like i don't know 17th birthday or something nice. and uh oh 17th christmas or whatever it was and, <laughs> and oh yeah I was like okay <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. Like, so now that was my first introduction to Ableton, but it was only like 
a demo, so you could only use like four tracks at a time and like very few little effects, and it was very limited. So I was just like putting samples in there and like hitting the buttons and like seeing what I could, doing mashups and things like that. And um, for a time, I was even putting like videos of my mashups on YouTube when I was like a kid. And I was like, oh, this is fun. But then I deleted them all because it was really embarrassing. Oh, damn it. <laughs> and I had really long hair and it was really gross. So, uh, <laughs> gross because you didn't wash it or gross because you just don't want to have long hair? <laughs> oh, I washed I took very good care of it. I was just, um, it just wasn't a good look for me. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> uh, but, those days are um, over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those days are over. It was it was nice while it lasted. It was good at the time. But yeah, so I had Ableton, I had a launch pad, and then it kind of grew from there, and eventually I ended up getting, you know, more and more and more into the, the yeah. software and the gear. Um, when did you kind of move toward the sound that has become your signature now? Because obviously you started off kind of cutting up these old disco tracks, doing your kind of Ed Banger, Breakbot meets Justice thing. When did yeah. you start to find the sound that is Wave Racer? So it was when, it was around 2013 or late, yeah, early 2013, I was, we've been doing Pablo J and the Lobsterettes for a couple, like for a few years, from like 2010. And so uh, I was kind of just getting, what I was See, I was, like I said, I was already a guitarist and I was playing in bands and I was always into composing music on guitar and stuff like that. And I found that the Pablo J thing was very limiting in terms of how I was able to create because it was entirely sample-based. Mm -hmm. It was entirely relying on other people's compositions. And I was like, I want to be able to make my own stuff and produce it from scratch. I heard a little bit of like electronic music that was kind of coming out at that time. There was, I think it was... One artist, notably, is Kashmir Cat, and there's also Hudson Mohawk and Rusty mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, wow, these guys are creating the same level of excitement that that electronic music is producing that I love, but they're also doing it completely from scratch. They're making everything themselves. They're using synthesizers and designing their own sounds. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try that. So I took it upon myself to learn a little bit about sound design and so using synthesis. Um, so moving away from using just samples and being like, okay, I want to actually make everything myself, not just the music, but the sounds themselves. So that was kind of my foray into, um, into proper music production, like yeah. proper production. Um, so I was, that's kind of when the wave racer sound, I suppose, started to develop when I was like, okay, if I'm creating sounds from scratch, what do they sound like? What, what is the sound that comes out of my brain when I try to create a sound and then that is what turned into Wave Racer. Man, I love that the sounds that just came out of your brain were like fun, plucky, weird, taking you back to your N64 days. Like, was that yeah, kind of I initially I, the drive? It just happened that way. It just happened. It just happened that way. It was just like, I need to, like, whatever I found interesting, like when I was, exper it was a lot of experimentation. I was like, what happened? Like, I, I had to learn about what a, an oscillator, like a, a synth oscillator was and like what all that kind of fun stuff is and like how electronic production works and I was like I'm learning all this stuff and experimenting with it all and I would just like the the sounds that excited me were the ones that I kept and the ones that I explored further and mm -hmm. um you know there was still influence from a lot of the stuff I was listening to like those artists that I mentioned Kashmir Cat Hudson Mohawk oh yeah Rusty like Lucky Me as a label yeah was doing crazy cool stuff all of that it. stuff Shout and I was like wow that. these guys are using really interesting sound designs that I've never heard before um and I was like, I want to figure out a way that I can do that. Um, and it first started out with me not really trying to do anything original. I was just trying to copy these guys. I was just trying to be like, I want to know how they do that. So I just tried to replicate it. Yeah. But then once I kind of learned how to replicate it or the process of trying to replicate it, I was like, oh, I've actually stumbled across something quite unique and original and fun here. Yeah. So that was how it happened. I, I mean, think. going back to our talk before, is there anything more punk rock than making your own sounds out of nothing? Like... I, I suppose. I mean, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's kind of, now that you mention it, it is a little bit. Um, not that I was deliberately trying to do that. It was just a, it was like, honestly, just a, a journey of discovery, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to yeah. shout out illustrious illustrio son i'm always so bad at saying these names uh glad you joined us and jerk at work wants to know how much of what you are doing today is sample based do you use samples at all anymore i do i still use samples i never stopped using samples um it's just the way that i use them is different and i'm not using like i try not to use any copyrighted samples now obviously because yeah get <laughs> yeah <in trouble>. exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I use samples. I use samples for lots of different things. Um, and I also create my own samples. So like 
I, now that I know how audio works a bit better, I've actually figured out how I can create my own libraries of sounds and samples and stuff. So that's kind of my approach now is like, I want to be able to use the flexibility and the awesome and funness that samples can provide, but I also want to be able to do it in my, on my own terms. So I'll combine, you know, samples that exist already from like drum machines or whatever it might be. A lot of drum machine samples, yes. a lot of things like that. Um, yeah. It's interesting you say that. I interviewed Giraffage once. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but yeah. he has a very nostalgic 90s kind of sound. And I asked him once, you know, how do you get that sound that just sounds so reminiscent to me of the sounds of like the TV shows from my childhood or something? And he was like, oh, well, I use vintage 90s synthesizers and drum machines, That's you it. know? Yeah. And like, that yeah. does it. Do, do you have pieces like that in your collection or what kind of stuff um, are you working with gear wise? I don't have any actual hardware vintage pieces, but I use a lot of the sounds from those vintage pieces. And there's a lot of digital, like modern digital recreations of those that exist as software. So I have a lot of those like vintage sounds on my computer um, and I use them all the time. Like there's the Korg M1, there's like these old like Prophet synthesizers from the 70s and 80s and like all this awesome like mode plugins and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, they have a sound that you just can't help but associate with it time yeah um i do have my own analog pieces of gear that i sometimes use but they're they're like modern analog like they're like trying to bring that that old vintage vibe into the future so i have like a few synths like that as well but yeah. i also have that like roll and drum machine that has every single old roll and drum machine yes. in it so it sounds exactly like the old units as well so yeah definitely i love it that's and I see definitely exists in my studio you've got quite a few guitars back there as well yeah, I've got three electric guitars, one acoustic guitar, and one bass guitar. I love it. Do you play uh, the bass on flash drive? Did you, like, originally do no, that? No, no. <laughs> that was some before... some sick slot bass. Like, That's say. actually from, well, funnily enough, I just mentioned it, the Korg M1 is, like, a, an old sampler thing from Korg back yeah, in the 80s. Yeah. Um, that is the, like, the Seinfeld bass sound. Yes, it's um, totally Seinfeld, you're right. Yeah. Burp, so burp, that, burp, that's, burp. Exactly, that sound is not actually a real, like, that's a sampled bass guitar, it's not a real bass guitar. I mean, so, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I, I, back then, when I, was, when I was making that song, I had, I didn't have these instruments, I didn't have anything, I was yeah. like, it was just me and a computer and, like, a illegally downloaded copy of Korg M1 BST, <laughs> yes, so, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Korg, sponsor him, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I paid for it now, I have yeah. a real version, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anyone is interested in hearing more about how you put these sounds together, you have just begun your journey on Twitch yourself, yeah. doing some production back looks. I don't know exactly how to say that. Um, yeah, tell I mean, everyone I, about your break, Twitch like, stream. Yeah, so I, I've only done a few streams so far, but I've just been started, like, once. I'm kind of doing once a fortnight at the moment. I'm doing going back and looking at an old song or a new song and, like, um, doing a production breakdown, so going over the whole project file, looking at every single layer, all the sounds that went into the songs, how I made them, um, how they came to be, telling a bit of the backstory about how I got there and, like, um, how how I designed designed all the sounds and how I produced the songs. And I did my old uh, song Bubble Wrap from 2015 was the last one I did. And then before that I did Hire. And then before that I did Auto as well. So I've done a few of those. If you got, yeah, anyone who wants to know a little bit more nerdy technical stuff about how I do these songs, it's, it's like I, I have great, I get great joy from talking about how I produce stuff because it's like what I do for a living. So being able to talk about it and have people listen and enjoy is like, it's great for me. Yeah. So, yeah, tune in. <laughs> I, I, I get the sense that maybe if it wasn't what you did for a living, you'd still be doing this. Like, oh, if, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I often think about that. I often think even if I, even if my career was like totally financially non-viable and I had no opportunity to be a successful artist, I would still want to do this every day. So, yeah. yeah. I think that's what it takes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because either you're going to put in that work or you're not, I guess. I, yeah, I think you're right. I'm yeah. seeing a couple questions come in, but before we go much further, I wanted to play uh, your song This and That, which was your last single from 2019. And yeah. I really like this song because it has a bit of emotional poignancy to it in a way that I think is uh, newer in your catalog. Like, it's very happy, but it also has some melancholy mixed into it. Um, yeah. Why don't you talk to me about this song a little bit before we play it for everyone? Yeah. 
So this and that is uh, featuring Lunch Money Lewis on vocals. He's the so he's the guy who wrote and recorded and performed all the vocals on the song. He's like, I, I mean, it's hard talking. In Australia, Lunch Money Lewis had a really big song called Bills, and it was huge. Um, I don't know if he had that same level of like recognition in America, but he's like he was the number one artist in Australia. I so feel it was like I crazy did for, hear it though. Yeah. Yeah. He had like a bunch. Of, he had a very successful run of, of some singles and like did music with Doja Cat and all that kind of stuff. And like, he's, he was quite a big deal. So for me to be able to like work with him was pretty crazy, just for context. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, he he came uh, to Sydney when I was living there and did a session with myself and Cosmos Midnight. And we kind of we're just like writing songs and hanging out and recording music. And um, we sent him a bunch of demos that we had lying around for like things that he might want to track vocals on. One of them was a demo for this and that. Um, which sounded very different at the time, but he really liked it. And he went back to Miami where he lived at the time and recorded some vocals. And, um, yeah, and uh, and that's kind of what turned into the song. And I think lyrically he was just trying to talk about a relationship, um, you know, honesty and openness and, like, uh, you know, emotional transparency, basically, in a relationship and talking about how, you know, if, if you really mean something, you've got to, you've got to say it, you've got to, you've got to not play me for a fool, don't beat around the bush, like, tell me what you really think, you know, mm -hmm. do you want to be with me or not, kind of vibe. That was the, kind of the point of the song. And I think that resonated with me because there's a, there's a, I'm a, I'm a very technology-driven kind of thinker and relationships that in, exist in digital form now are so strange um, and how most people meet pe new people and meet partners and stuff is very, like, online technology-driven. It was like that lack of clarity that you get from not knowing if someone you're interested in thinks the same way about you is exacerbated so much by having that relationship exist purely online totally. and not being able to read their body language, not being able to speak to them all the time, not being able to look at them in the face, not being able to like talk to them openly and candidly about something. And the video, which you might show the, vi the visualization has will, a lot of yeah. that like text text messages and like and like digital communications to do with relationships which i think perfectly accompany what uh lunch money lyrics lunch money lewis's lyrics were trying to get at like yeah. they, we want clarity we want healthy communication driven relationships but yeah. that's very hard at the moment it's almost basically. a little triggering this visualizer because it's like who hasn't had these exact phrases told to them or like well, had this exactly. moment on a text message where you're just like ah! literally i think literally everybody so, yeah. <laughs> including myself so that's yeah. why I was like this is actually something really cool that I want to put in music because yeah. if I can if I can put this message out there and let other people know that other people feel this way it's like that that's got to mean something maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> I agree I agree okay so we'll watch this and that with Lunch Money Lewis and when we come back we'll get to some questions so drop your questions in the chat and yeah have a dance party okay Oh, gutted. Left, type, type, type. Nothing. <laughs> it's happened to all of us. Yeah, I'm, it has. I'm glad that you guys liked the visualizer. Illustrio San. Am I saying your name anywhere close to right? <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. Um, Illustrio San actually, before we played this and that, said... Uh, loves your work since they first heard flash drive. We're so glad when you came back with auto and that build up gave them chills, gives them chills down their spine every time. I'm like <laughs> translating from them saying you, whatever. Anyway, they just want to ask what is your favorite track that you have made so far? And is it something unreleased? Uh, that's a good question. Um, to, I think, uh, let me divide that into two okay. of the released of the released tracks that I have out in the world. I think Auto is my favorite. Um, my second favorite would be uh, my remix I did of Ryan Hemsworth back in like 2015. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, but I gotta say, all the music that I have coming out next year, all of that is my favorite. Like, I'm so excited. All of that. Yeah. So, um, but that being said, uh, yeah, I think it's not like necessarily better than what I've already done, but it's just it's different and exciting for me. So that's yeah. why it's my favorite. You just mentioned um, Brian Hemsworth, and that kind of brought me back mentally to all that, like, that future bass explosion time. And I yeah. wanted to ask you, like, what was that moment like from your perspective? Because 
here in the States, everyone was just like, what's happening on Australia? What's in the water over there? Like, all the dopest acts are over there. And I don't know. Yeah. Just like for, for, there was like a solid two years where I feel like that was just, and then everyone copied the sound that you and others were doing. And I don't know. What yeah. was it like from your perspective? It's strange. I, honestly, I can't speak to why there's this association to Australia. I mean, I, I, I will acknowledge that, yeah, there was a lot of artists in Australia doing stuff that was making an imprint globally. Like, that's definitely true, especially with electronic music. And obviously, you know, it goes without saying that Flume was a huge part of that. And, like, there's no question about that. And then what's in it? Like, touring, you know, touring the States and going on world tours and all this stuff. Like, but... I think, to be honest, the influence that drove my music production, and I can't speak for other people, but for, for me, uh, a lot of it was coming ex like outside of Australia. Like My location didn't mean a huge amount to what was influencing me artistically because, you know, I mean, it's cliche that the age of the internet, you get influences from absolutely everywhere around the world constantly, so there's nothing... Mm -hmm. Like, it's a combination of being in Australia and having, you know, a relatively high quality of life and, like, being able to afford computers and, like, having good education and, like, all that stuff matters, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think artistic... Maybe there's something to do with that. Maybe there's something to do with the Australian culture, the quality of life we have here... Um, the weather like i don't know maybe there's something about it being here that, that that allows people to explore themselves creatively in a way that's exciting that maybe that doesn't exist in other places i can only speculate though mm -hmm. um it's interesting to it's interesting to to speculate about yeah and uh yeah. what did when you first heard the term future base was that like after you started the wave racer project or was that something that you were aware of when it was happening no, I, I had never heard about that um, until someone mentioned, until it was like mentioned alongside my name in an article or something. Like I'd never, I'd never even, I even to this day don't really know what it means because it's, it encompasses such a broad range of, of different people who, who they classify as that. Yeah. And so I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I've never been a huge fan of like, obviously labels. And I think, I don't think many artists are fan of like labeling or pigeonholing themselves, but I, l I let people classify my music in whatever way they see fit, um, and I don't really mind it either way, as long as they're enjoying it and listening, and um, you know, not not saying horrible things. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Trolls future base is a term. It's yeah, it's 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 a weird term because it doesn't really like it doesn't really to me. I don't know what it really means or represents. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's, it's kind of like this very, it's a very vacuous, broad arching umbrella term that covers so many different stuff. And I, I'm, more, I'm more interested in talking about like the artists and like yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of artists, um, so these last few songs that you've put out, I guess we'll say like uh, Wave Racer 2.0 era <laughs> music. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've been working with vocalists a lot more. Um, mm. Jerk at Work actually asked, uh, if you've been approached by hip hop artists and what that conversation is like for you. Um, but also, I mean, you have been working more with vocal artists, so I'm interested in how yeah. that process has affected your creativity and the way you make a song. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of two questions. Sorry to throw out no, that, two that, questions. No, at that, you. Is two, that is two questions, but I can talk about them both at the same time. Uh, to answer Jerk at Work's question, um, I have been approached by hip hop artists. Like I'm, con I always get approached by various people doing hip hop stuff, and I love hip hop music. But I've actually attempted in the past to incorporate that kind of style into the music that I was making, um, and I, like, my instinct was that it would work really well. My instinct was that it's like, yeah, I could definitely have rappers like doing really cool stuff over the beats that I make or whatever, and. It's funny that every time I've attempted that, it hasn't worked very well, um, which is very interesting. It's it's always it's interesting to see how it doesn't go the way you expect. What is it um, that goes different? Like, what is it that you think is wrong? <laughs> it's, I think I think what it is is that I was having trouble. Like for me, music and art is very important. That it's very genuine, mm -hmm. and um, for me to have my name on a piece of work, but then to have a rapper come and say something about their life or like something that is not pertinent to my experience in any way felt very disingenuous yeah. and I had trouble coming to terms with that. That being said, if I was producing a song for somebody else under their name and I was just acting as a producer, like absolutely 
hundred percent like down to do that. Oh, but, sick! <laughs> yeah, but um, for me, and this kind of goes into what you're asking about working with vocals. Uh, I have also tried working with many other vocalists, like feature vocalists and stuff, and I have released some stuff like that, like like with the Lunch Money Lewis track and all that. And um, it does work sometimes if the experience of the person singing the lyrics is something that I can represent in my own experiences and works with the music that I'm making. But I've actually found that using my own voice has been the most successful path. So auto, it features my own voice on it. And that's, that's one of the reasons it's my, it's my favorite track that I've done as well, because it I is it. purely, it's purely me. And the stuff coming out next year is just more and more of that, like a lot more that. of that. So um, that's kind of, yeah, working with vocals was like, oh, I'd love to have vocals on my song. I want to be able to have my songs be poppy and be able to sing along and have some sort of meaning with the lyrics and stuff. And I was like, I was trying to do that for years and years and years. Like since 2014, I've been like, how do I get vocals incorporated into this music? And I've tried and tried different things and nothing really stuck. But then I was like, why don't I just do it myself? And so I just did that and I was like, yeah. there we go, that works. And how freeing. <laughs> and I really love the lyrics of Auto. Like I kind of felt immediately that there was a bit of tension in the lyrics, this kind of feeling of like fighting with yourself while being a creative person. And like, it just, it won't just come automatically or whatever. Right. Like, absolutely. And, yeah. and I That's think exactly that, right. yeah. And you did, it's not like the song hits you over the head. It's, it's very happy, but in those lyrics, you do get to kind of like put this little like anxiety bubble <laughs> that I yeah, picked up yeah. on at least. <laughs> yeah, no, you picked up on it. That's it. You kind of hit it on the, it hit it the nail on the head. It's, um, yeah, I mean, that song, it was like about uh, trying to satisfy the the artistic needs of yourself, but also trying to satisfy the, uh, I guess, the needs of other people in your audience, but having something, like having that incompatibility be a problem that has to be worked through sometimes. And people like, sometimes just say, oh, why don't you just do this? And it's like, well, it's not that easy. Like, mm. it, you have to, it takes a bit more work than that. It takes a bit more thought than that. And um uh, yeah, there's just a, there's a sense of frustration associated with that. There's a sense of anxiety associated with that, and it felt like the perfect song to put out to come back after a long period of of being away and being anxious and being like, what's going on? And then I was like, you know what? Let's just put it all in. Let's just put my voice on the song and say and just express what's happening. And um, I'm super proud of that. Yeah, I love it. And you have the fun robot voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was because I, I didn't feel confident enough to have just my normal voice. Well, actually, I recorded my normal voice, and then I was like, well, I need to make this a bit more interesting somehow because I wasn't very well practiced with using my vocals. Also, so like, was, to have to listen to your own voice over and over and over again when you're oh, not used to it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but that's funny, actually, because now I'm I'm well beyond that point. Like, I've I've gotten past the point where I need to, like, overly process my vocals, and I actually do just sing naturally now, which that's is exciting. kind of... That's exciting. That's Open, that's opened up a lot of horizons for how I can produce songs now because it means that I've uh, sort of expanded the um, the palette of sounds that I can use, so to speak. So, oh. yeah, that's um, it's always it's always growing and changing. But yeah, Auto was my first dipping my toes into that. Yeah. I love it. Talk to us more about the new music that, or I mean, I don't even know how new it is. Like some of these songs that have come out recently, you said you've worked on for like two plus years. Um, but what are some of the themes that you're doing? Like, what other stuff are you singing about? What other sort of direction sonically are you exploring? Like, what is yeah. what is the uh, horizon that you're dancing on these days? That's a great question. And um, it's, ha it's a hard thing to explain or talk about without demonstrating it with the music itself. So I, I have to, I, like, I'm going to be very, I'm going to be very keen and excited to talk more about this when the music is out. Yeah. Um, but even even despite that, I can still say that um, the music that I'm doing that's coming out now that people haven't heard yet is definitely a shift stylistically, but it still has me, all of me, the same part of me that was in all the music that everyone's heard is still here in this music too. It's all like that is not, um, it's, it's even though it sounds stylistically different, it might be a surprising shift in, in ter tonality that people might be used to hearing, they will still recognize me in the music. And there's a lot of songs that do have a lot of those, you know, classic signatures that, you know, I sort of created using this, my classic sound design and all that kind of stuff. And like, what's different really is, is that lyrically it's, it's all like, it's focused on, a, on the themes of like growth and uh, trying to, you know, like kind of how high I touched on overcoming 
things and how auto touched on dealing with grappling with personal anxieties and, and stuff like that. The, the, what I'm working on now is, is kind of, uh, embellishing on those ideas and plus a lot more and a lot to do with more like relationships and, uh, you know, coming to grips with, you know, remote emotional maturity and, um, uh, you know, coming into, uh, uh, adult adulthood and being more mature as an adult and like just lo- like it's a, it's it's about learning it's about growth and it's about learning and it's about um how you can manage to hang on despite the things that make you want need to fall out like make make you trying to push you over all the time like yeah. so i mean it's kind of like a, it's it's got it's got a message in it and it's got um a, a new a lot of new instrumentation as well like a lot of different stuff that people probably haven't heard from me before that's exciting okay a i'm personally excited to hear that because that's just what life is right we we can't stay in the same place forever and we shouldn't want to i mean i I understand that that can sometimes be a struggle especially if you are a professional creative and everyone just wants um you just stay the same all the time, all the time. But I don't even know if that's really true. I feel like if you gave someone the same thing three times, they'd be like, all right, I've heard this, fucking whatever. Absolutely. Let's move on. Um, and yeah. also, like, those are really important themes. And I think that we culturally are kind of waking up to more of these ideas of, like, growth. And I don't know. You Maybe I'm following those types of Instagram accounts. But I feel like among maybe. my friends, like, yeah. th- these are all themes we can all relate to, especially after a year like this. Um, yeah. And I'm sure it's cathartic for you, like, to even have a chance to write about stuff like that must be lovely. Absolutely, <laughs> hugely cathartic. It, it's, it's huge. It's been, it's been such, a, like, a feeling of just, like, it feels so right. It just feels like, uh, it feels like I didn't have a choice. It's like, I either do, it's either I do this and I explore this, or I don't do anything. Like, yeah. I have to do, I kind of just didn't have a choice. But I think, like, if I can maybe sort of, add a little bit of my own social commentary into this interview. I think Please it's like <laughs> what was happening in the past, like, you know, five to seven, eight years ago was like, there was this, I mean, people call it now, they call it parasocial relationships, which is like the relationship between someone viewing online content and the person creating that content mm. and how there's this connection between those two people that is like a social relationship, but it's not really like a real life social relationship. It's like this fake sort of semi-social relationship. Um, and there's a lot of the things that are essential to relationships are missing from that. So what happened back then, I would say, and this is just me speculating, but I think people were embracing that at that time because it was new. They were like, oh, we can express ourselves on Instagram and put this like awesome fake version of ourselves out there. And it's like, how cool is that that we get to express ourselves in this cool digital way? And like, um, everyone was like, oh, that's so exciting. That's so cool and fresh. And then everyone started doing that and it was like, wow and everyone's sort of hid their true selves because that was way less interesting and then now everyone's like okay we've done that um but we've actually also learned that we really need to connect with people otherwise we get really sad so um <laughs> they were like, okay now let's let's value actually um embra- like learning from what we've done with all that weird digital social stuff but also let's try to be real humans as well while also living in the world that has to do all of that yeah. so i think that's the that's the big shift that's happened culturally between the years of like 2012 to 2020 and now like you said i think everyone is moving towards it like oh okay yeah we need to actually be humans again kind of kind of thing yeah (laughs) and it makes sense that your music should mirror that um yeah i think a lot of people's music is mirroring that yeah Yeah. before i forget though i'd love to hear some of the new instruments and the broader instrumentation you said you've been working with too like Yep. I know so, you can't. I'm, I know people in the chat are like, play some of the new stuff. And I'm like, I don't think that, I don't know if you even can. But. I can't, I can't play, I can't like, right now, I can't like play new music because yeah. it's obviously like, I have a record deal that has to be like, you know, I have Keep, to be Keeping the lights on with. in 2020? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but um, with that being said, there is some, like, I am, I think I am actually doing some like digital performances coming up, which may feature some new music. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, but, you know, looking behind me, you can see I've got all my guitars there. That's featured heavily on the record, on, like, all the new records. I love the guitar jams you've been dropping yeah. on some of the, the um, newer stuff, too. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of that, because, I mean, that's that's the instrument that I know best. Um, there's a microphone right there as well, you can see. Um, that's uh, recording a lot of, like, voice and other things, like other gu- acoustic instruments. Um, lots of keyboards, lots of analog synth, analog synth stuff. Um 
like that I'm playing live, um, and even some like weird like modular sort of digital devices that are creating like uh, like sounds that aren't coming from inside a computer, but are actually coming from other sound sources. Whereas in the past, it was all just inside the computer. Yeah. Um, now I'm capturing stuff from outside in the real world and putting it in the computer. So yeah, that involves a lot of you know instrumentation that uh, you can't really do on a computer, like playing guitar, for example, or piano, or like whatever, oh, yeah. whatever else. Yeah. We have a question. What do you play when driving? Asking because uh, they put your music on when cruising down the highway, which is very fun, I can say yeah. from experience. Okay. What are your driving I, tunes? I have to, I have to, I hate to disappoint, but I don't actually have a driver's license. Ah! I, don't drive. <laughs> <laughs> I Incredible. Don't drive. I, I live in oh, a city that has you, really you, good public transport and I ride. There you are. Oh, Sorry. You can, <laughs> you're see, back. can you hear and see me? I'm yeah, good. I'm good. good. Okay. I live in a city that has really, really good uh, public transport and I have a really good bike and I just <laughs> do that. Do you have biking drive. music or do you maybe like safely for safety reasons you don't listen to safety music? Safety reasons? Like that, but... I, I don't because I, I want to be able to hear if I'm about to get hit by a truck or something. But uh, <laughs> Fair, fair. Um, yeah. No, I... I, I, I do hear a lot of people tell me that they listen to my music while driving, which is really nice to hear because I, I am familiar with the feeling of, you know, road tripping and playing music in the car. Like, that's a good feeling. Yeah. Um, but I can't say that I have, like, a go-to thing because I just don't spend enough time in a car to do that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> um, are you a sports fan? Are you into Australian football? We got an Australian football fan in the in the chat. Uh Everyone else in this country is. I must be the only person who is not. I don't. Um, I don't know much. I mean, AFL is probably what they're talking about, the Australian Football League. Um, that's like the biggest thing that this country has. It's like a public holiday here. It's like a major. Wow. Event. Um, I don't know anything about it. I like tennis. I like watching the Australian Open. I like um, following that uh, and other similar things like that but yeah that's kind of it i'm not a huge sports guy well you're i'll share this with you because i know you're a justice fan as well but i once interviewed them and i was like oh you guys like love wearing oakland uh jackets and stuff like are you into football and they were like no we're not into football we're not even into like football football yeah. like every everyone <laughs> here in paris is just like woo world cup and we we don't care we just think the jackets are super cool so <laughs> yeah it's just style it's just good style yeah, yeah. Um, Edward Plays League wants to know if you have any future collaborations coming up that you can tease people that you've been working with. I actually don't. For the, now that I'm thinking about it, for the first time in a while, I don't have any... Uh, I'm focusing, and this is partly deliberately, I'm collaborating with less people so that I can focus on my own output, just my own individual output, which is exciting but might, might be disappointing for people who want to hear more collabs but um i can't no i actually don't i actually am focusing purely on individual creation and output and i get that you know all that's all that gross ego stuff that's associated with working <laughs> with other people is out the window which is nice and refreshing for me it is nice i get that too sometimes like um when i feel like i really want to be creative and write some stuff it's like i just don't read as much like there's almost yeah. a time there's like a time for taking in and then there's a time for putting out <laughs> and sometimes Absolutely. when you're being creative it's best to like just be alone in your head i don't know <laughs> I, and also i will add to that um collaboration is really really good for some people and it's really like useful in a lot of contexts but um i find that i am actually more creative when i just do it myself like i find it very difficult sometimes to um let other people get involved <laughs> and that's probably a fault of mine but um <laughs> I don't have to think as much. If it's just me, I get to just do what I want. Mm -hmm. And that's usually what produces the best results. Yeah. Illustrio San said they missed what DAW you use. It's Ableton. You, pr you pretty much exclusively use Ableton? Yep, exclusively Ableton. Um, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just like everybody else. Um, yeah. I want to talk to you about the live aspect of performance, though, because you are incorporating all of this new instrumentation and you are bringing a live show to what it is that you do. I think in December, you at least got to do one live show before live shows stopped happening. I don't know if you guys are doing shows in Australia, but... Um... No, we, uh, I did... I, uh, December and January, like over New Year, I did a festival here called Falls Festival, which is like a New Year's festival. Um, 
and it, it's in like three different four different locations around the country and i did the cool. whole tour so i did actually one of them got cancelled because of the bushfires but i oh, did yeah. one i did three i did the other three and um uh yeah, it was a live show with uh, me and two other musicians. So we had a three-piece band, and I was on guitar and keys up front, and then I had a drummer with me and a bass player and a keyboard player, a bass slash keyboard player. And um, yeah, we we did my first ever like live band show, and it was really really fun. It was probably the most amount of work I've ever put into anything, <laughs> but it was so um, exciting and thrilling. Um, and it's re- it is really a shame that after after putting in all that, those weeks of rehearsals and all that stuff, COVID had to hit like four weeks later. And, um, cause we were planning on, um, we we're planning on going on, on more, like on tour around the country. We were going to go do more shows. We we're going to play more festivals, like all this oh. stuff we were planning on doing, planning on going to Asia, planning on going to America I'm with so, this whole live show. I'm so sad. I, know, <laughs> I mean, well, I know it'll so happen one day, like one day yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll all have the plan- this. I was going to, the plan was to like try and put that stuff together and announce something throughout 2020. But then all of those plans were just thrown out the window and as, as with everybody else. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was very fortunate to be able to go through the process of putting together that live show and getting that experience because that means when live shows come back again, I already have a bit of a head start there, but um, it looks it so shame. cool. Uh, you guys should go to Wave Racer's Instagram, Wave Racer Music, because that's where I saw some clips from the show, and I was yeah. just like instantly so jealous, and <laughs> that I couldn't <laughs> see that right now. It actually sounds really fucking good. It's not like yeah. you had to do a lot of transcribing in making the sound change. You know what I mean? Because you you do have this very electronic sound, but it sounds yeah. like it came to life brilliantly. We, we put a lot of work into into making sure that the sounds that I used in the production were all compatible in a live context. So I had this really good music director who I worked with who's like a really good music director here in Australia. He does a lot of the live stuff here. And um, he helped me sort of build the show by going through all my old stems, old tracks, and being like, okay, we have to break all of this down into parts, wow. like bounce out every single note that you want to play and like do all this cool technical stuff and then like, walking me through how to like set up live guitar tone and like like synths and all that kind of stuff and it was like i said a lot of work it took yeah. like weeks and like a lot of rehearsal and um but yeah it was it's worth it because that's how you that's how you put together a good live show yeah. <laughs> and someone was doing that slap bass <laughs> someone, someone doing the slap yeah. bass timmy yeah my friend tim he was the bass player he uh he was playing the bass live we oh we God. actually did that and he <laughs> We it took him a few weeks to tr- like to do it, but we sent him the thing like the song, and he was like, "Yeah, I reckon I can do it." And so he like practiced that slap, and then he like transcribed it out and like played it live, which is pretty wild. It yeah. is so yeah. How does it feel <laughs> to see that happen? It was pretty cool. Um, I, it sounded like it really just brought, put the whole song into a new context because I never expected anyone to be able to like when I programmed that. Like I said, it was a, it was a key, programmed in a keyboard, so I didn't have any idea that an actual bass player would be able to play that but that's so cool i think he had to take some shortcuts here and there to like make it work but um it worked and it sounded great so, so yeah cool. well i'm really crossing my fingers and first of all hoping that everyone out there stays safe and healthy and that your families do as well and that we are all able to come together to enjoy live music again as soon as possible because I would really like to see the live wave racer show personally. <laughs> I want it. I want everyone to hear it. I'm I, like, yeah, no one's sadder than I am that I didn't get to take it out on the road, but one day. So, oh, someone last time they saw wave racer was at the observatory in Santa Ana a long time mm. ago. Is that California? Yeah. That's like, uh, yeah, I remember that show. That was, that was one of my biggest shows in America actually. Yeah. Cool. Oh, that was, nice. That was really cool. Yeah. I like sold out the whole place. It was like a really fun show. Yeah. Oh, I like this question too. Jamie Wo wants, first of all, she says Mr. Racer, which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Racer. <What>? Very formal. <laughs> What's an Aussie <laughs> phrase the rest of the world should adopt? Oh, wow. Put us on. Uh, bonza. <laughs> bonza? What's that? What did I just say on the internet? Uh, I don't. <laughs> I never use this, but like I, I would never say this in actual real life. But it is, it is a thing that Aussie people say. It just means like awesome, just like cracking, like uh, yeah. sick. Bonza. It's, it's just like that's, 
that's bloody buns of mate. Like, that's what people say. Oh, I'm doing anyway, that. My friends yeah. and I are doing that. <laughs> Why wouldn't you ever say it? <laughs> um, because it's, a, it's, I don't know, it's like, it's a weird Aussie dialect that people in the city don't talk like that. It's like, I don't know, it's kind of like how, I guess you, I don't know, it's like, I don't know if this is offensive or not, but it's like rednecks. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like that. Well, it's yeah. not offensive to me. And and my family's okay. pretty close to rednecks, so it's really... Right. No, I mean, get that's a pass. the thing. We're all, we're all, like, the Australian version of a redneck is a bogan, and we are all bogans at heart. We're all... Every, every Australian is that. It's just that some people are not afraid to show it. I love it. Wait, <laughs> do, do bogans drink Fosters? Fosters? Um, this is a common misconception, and I'm, gonna, I'm about to give you some knowledge. There's a common misconception that Foster's is a beer that everyone drinks here because it's Australian. They don't. Nobody drinks Foster's Nobody here. drinks it's Foster's. Not, only, the only people who drink Foster's are, like, people trying to, like, uh, be Australian in other places. Like, no one... You can't even buy Foster's at, at like... Is it Australian at all? Like, is it... It made? is. It's, oh. It is Australian, but no one actually drinks it because... It's like too, I don't know, it's like too typical or something. People who actually drink beer like to drink other beer here. For like They'll drink like Heineken or whatever. That's <laughs> so funny. No I love that Foster's has made an entire global campaign around like, yeah. we're the Australian beer. And then in Australia, it's just like, oh, no. Yeah, it's Australian beer for everywhere outside of Australia. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Has anyone ever tried to like put it, I guess you would have a rider if you were on a show, but does anyone like give you Foster's at clubs when you leave Australia? I mean, yes, I think that has happened. I don't drink beer, but I, I think people have definitely tried to buy me Foster's in America God. before. But yeah, I, are, I had to politely decline. Are you aware of the Bloomin' Onion? Do you know what Outback Steakhouse is in the United States? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, Do you uh, have again, them in Australia? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, again, it's not really something that I've ever seen. As an Austra I've lived in Australia my no, whole life. I'm pretty years, sure I've never it seen. is an American, like, weird yeah. Australian... I don't know. I'm, I'm sure, sure it's I'm offensive. sure it was like a thing that is what like someone like maybe back in the seventies existed and was like became Australiana, kinda like what's that movie? Um what's that movie oh, that everyone Rescuers Down Under? No, no, there's like Oh, oh, no, oh, 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 oh Th that's not this a knife. A, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's not a knife. This is a knife, yeah. That thing, like that's so big outside. Like, that's the biggest thing ever in America that everyone associates with Australia. I feel like the Bloomin' Onion's a bit like that. Oh, God. I'm First of all, yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize on behalf of all Americans for uh, the way that we've portrayed <laughs> Australia all these years. No, no, it's great. It's great. I love it. I, I'm, I'm sure that... Are there, like, weird American things? Like, do you guys think you know what American beer is? Or <laughs> I mean, probably, yeah. I think, well, to be honest, America's probably better represented here than Australia is represented over there because yeah. Americans, it's so big and, like, global. But, True. Uh, we, we've people, done the hard work for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Australia is, yeah, we know, we know pretty, we know a lot about you guys, and uh, it's hard, it's hard for you guys to hide the truth. <laughs> that is, that sounds about right, yeah. Um, well. Yeah, someone in the chat said Crocodile Dundee, that's, that's exactly it. what I was thinking of. Crocodile yeah. Dundee, that's what a thing. One. Wait, wasn't, um, that lovely man who loved the animals, is he Australian? Steve Irwin? Yeah, was he Australian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was Australian. He was one of the most famous Australians. That's a win. We love yeah. Steve Irwin. <laughs> yeah, again, he, he, way bigger in America than he was here. Really? But he was pretty big here, too. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah. we love Steve Irwin. Um, yeah. Wave Racer, we, we, we're about at our time here. We've been chatting okay. for a while. Um, is there anything else that you want to let us know? Like, do you have your next single lined up? Do you know... Uh, are you streaming regularly? What days do you stream? Like, give me yeah. all the info I need as a huge Big Fat Wave Racer fan <laughs> before we get uh, off sure. the stream. So, yep, I got, we got the next single planned coming out uh, next year, uh, early next year with that planned. We, uh, and plus more to come shortly after that. Um, we've got a whole body of work planned for next year. Are um, you, which like, is extremely in exciting. album mode? Is this, are we talking album I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to officially say, but let's just say, yeah. <laughs> um, I it's, love it. <laughs> uh, it's it's a body of work along those lines, yeah. And um, but as for streaming, yeah. In the meantime, while we wait for all that music to be ready and come out, it is almost ready. It's in its final stages, um, which I'm extremely excited about. Uh, I am doing, yeah. I'm doing 
Twitch streams where I go over my songs, my productions. Um, I'm talking about how I made my music, how I make my music now, the kinds of things I did in the past and how I'm doing things now in the future. I'm also just going to use it as an opportunity to do more stuff like this where I just chat with people, answer questions, um, listen to music, uh, you know, just connect with people because I feel like that is part of what the message of the new music is all about anyway. So it would be disingenuous for me to not do that. And then... Uh, also, just like maybe even doing like you know, just production chat, talking about how music, how I make, uh, how I can like use keyboards, the stuff in my studio, showing people the kind of stuff I do day to day, and I'm um, also making highlights of that, of those clips, yes. putting them up on my YouTube channel if you can't watch them live, um, so that anyone can still check it out, like check it out if they missed it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I'm spending my time in the meantime. Um, that's uh. That's all very did you, exciting. Did and you yeah. say is there a specific day you're doing those streams? Oh yeah, that's right. I'm doing uh, I'm doing them once a fortnight on a Thursday. So, uh, well, damn. Oh, sorry. Now yeah, now say, you got me like I don't what the yeah. fuck what? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I should say it's Thursday in Australia, Thursday morning here, which is actually Wednesday for you guys. I so, see. Uh, okay. It's actually pretty much at the exact same time that we started this today. Oh great. Uh, on th on Thursdays. Um, and I'm gonna try and do. I'm actually gonna try and do something once a week every Thursday. But the main song breakdowns and like the, um, the proper episodes where I do like an actual content thing. That's once every two weeks, Thursday at like this time. Cool. Yeah. Do you know what song you're gonna do next, or do you just I pick might, like that day? I make it. I, I kind of decide like a few days before. I'm thinking um, I might do this and that Ooh, next. Yeah. Um, but I haven't really decided yet. I have to. A lot of people want me to go back to the old, old songs like the Flash Drive EP and earlier singles and remixes and stuff. I also have to figure out if I'm allowed to do remixes mm. because other people's music is in it and that True. kind of stuff. So um, there's some things to figure out. But I'm not just doing song breakdowns either. I'm going to do some other stuff too. So keep your uh, keep your eyes on the on the Twitch channel on the YouTube channel and see what see what I'm up to. Hey, I might. <laughs> I might try to play some like old Nintendo games because that's my whole jam. I love old Nintendo. It's my whole thing. Yeah. So I thought like that might be fun to do one day on Twitch. And if you ever play video games on Twitch, you have to play Wave Race with me. <laughs> <laughs> I I would do that. I don't. I would have to get a copy of it first. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, um, to be honest with you, I've thought about playing video games on Twitch, but I'm just not that good at them. Yeah, well, that's why you got to play uh, the old classics, man. Bust out yeah. the Mario Kart. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I like to watch other people who are really, really, really good at video games do their thing on Twitch and YouTube and stuff. Like, I, that's my jam. I love watching people do, like, speedruns and stuff. That's so much fun for me. But I am just nowhere near that level of proficient <laughs> at video games to make that entertaining. But I am proficient at music production, exactly. so it may as well work to my strengths. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. That's why we tune in. Wave Racer, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time today coming on the stream. And thank you. I can't wait to hear the new music. I honestly, truly can't wait. I love it all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It was, it was fun to be here, and I'm happy to do this anytime. So yeah, thank you. Yay. All right. Well, hopefully, we'll chat with you soon. All Bye. Right. Great. Bye. See you later, guys. Thank you. Bye.